So, good news, everybody. We have a new data protection regulation which was formally approved last week by the European Parliament and it's going to enter into effect in two years. Now, the fines in the new data protection regulation were raised by quite a bit, so it's about 5% of the annual turnover that is the maximum risk for any company or enterprise that doesn't fulfill the requirements of the regulation. So this has caused quite a lot of activity around data protection now with a lot of law firms getting involved, big firms, small firms. Everyone is very interested. Um, and we hope that we will be able to convince you today that it doesn't need to be so difficult um, as it might appear a lot of the time. So you may ask yourself, what is the purpose of having a data protection law? Except I'm in Germany, so in Germany the Datenschutz tradition is quite a bit stronger than in many other parts of Europe. So uh, perhaps you already know that it's an imperative part of human rights and how you run the government and we all protect our own identities and uh, our right to self-determination in this way. We make a distinction between data protection and data security, where data protection is something that very, um, very focusedly protects individuals and their right to determine what happens uh, with data and their personality and who influences them under what circumstances. This can be contrasted with data security, uh, which is when things go through as foreseen. The data protection legislation in Europe is about data protection. It's not necessarily about data security. Um, I tried to exemplify with the uh, German BND, which I'm assuming are quite secure in their operations, but I think a lot of us will agree that they may not always consider data protection and self-determination uh, properties of their activities as they undertake them. So the data protection regulation, which is now approved, is based on five relatively simple principles, or more principles, it depends. It hasn't really consolidated about the around the fixed set yet, but for me, this is what really is the core of the regulation. So you have the right to know what happens with your data. You have the right to consent to what happens to your data. Um, the regulation is meant to be user-centric, meaning that you put the individual at the center and of your development process, of your technical system and your data management, and you always ensure that the individual has um, in its power the ability to decide what happens to them, their friends, family, and how they're influenced by their surroundings. There's also the principle of data minimization, which I think is important enough to raise on its own because it's the most clear intersection of data security and data protection in the regulation. You can't leak information you can't have, you can't misuse information that you don't have. Um, every principle that you apply should normally be uh, taking into account data minimization principles. There are some effective sanctions, which I already mentioned. Um, they're quite severe. Uh, one can keep them in mind if one wants to know why one uh, should take care to respect these four prior principles. Um, but I think the major uh, benefit of having effective sanctions is essentially that we're going to see a bigger push for legal clarity than we've had in the past around data protection laws. So our work has started last year. Uh, we work with websites, predominantly in uh, the public sector, and we've looked at various ways in which you can cheaply and quickly, and without having a lot of meetings, make websites that conform with the data protection principles. In order to do this, we have mapped how municipalities in Sweden organize their uh, web information towards citizens. Uh, we had quite good results <coughs> in that at least two municipalities out of 290 in Sweden seemed to comply with data protection principles last year in July. Now, when I looked back at one of those municipalities this year, it turns out they're now using Google Analytics, so they must fall off the list of approved principles, but one out of 290 isn't bad. Um, the reason that we focused on the public sector um, was that we were looking for something, we were looking for an organization that doesn't have a commercial interest in tracking users we concluded that in the public sector there are no real advantages to tracking or, or mapping consumer behaviors. Municipalities don't need to sell anything because anyone who lives in a particular city already lives there. They need information on healthcare or kindergartens and this type of thing. Uh, our uh, experience of interacting with municipalities has however been uh, somewhat different. It turns out that even when something is cheap and simple and quick, it takes a lot of meetings to um, 
uh, and a lot of um, uh, bureaucracy and administration to get stuff done. So one municipality that specifically got in touch with us to uh, uh, help them stop tracking uh, the citizens that visited their website took them six months to change from Google Analytics to some other analytics tool, which is more privacy preserving. So it's, uh, it's quickly turning into a challenge which is larger than we thought. Um, on the other hand, we receive a lot of positive comments as well, and so from libraries and other municipalities that are now also opening their eyes to this. I thought that I would make a specific mention of some of the problems that we've encountered when we've been speaking at developers' conferences in the past. Um, and these are principled problems that developers face in their daily activities, but where you have uh, simple ideological questions that need, um, I think, an answer in the context of these five principles of the data protection law. So the first one is, um, I've had the experience that web developers um, invent obligations on end users. Municipal organizations do the same thing. So for instance, you say, I need to track my users in order to optimize my website, because if I can't track them without informing them about it, how do I know what to improve? The problem with this type of reasoning is that end users that visit the website don't have an obligation to help normally. Um, and so if you phrase the question differently, rather than thinking, how do I improve, um, how can I make people help me improve myself, you should ask, do they have an obligation to, to assist me? And as long as your answer to this question is no, then probably you shouldn't be doing tracking without informing them. The other thing is curiosity. So a problem frequently faced by web developers when they interact with companies or with even the public sector as we've experienced is that uh, there are demands from up top. The bosses want to know how many people visit particular parts of the website, which type of information is um, is important to visitors, which information isn't important. But there's this expression that curiosity killed the cat, and sometimes you may want to actually object to cur curiosity, because similarly as end users do not have an obligation to assist anyone in improving themselves, um, they also actually don't have the obligation to, to silence or still down somebody's curiosity. Um, this is a place where I think one can be more straightforward with people who request tracking of end users, but it's also, of course, something that people who buy web, web development services um, need to take into account, that when they make demands, um, there's always an end user somewhere at the bottom. Um, a third problem, which I guess a lot of people are familiar with, is just doing things the way that they're always done. A lot of the time, tracking tools are just put in by habit. Whenever there's a new tracking tool, you add it to the old one, uh, rather than evaluating whether there's any need for tracking at all. And rather than changing processes in your organization, you continue to do stuff the way that they've been done since, since the old age. In the public sector, I can assure you this seems to be an extremely big problem, uh, but it's also something that I've heard from uh, developers who work in professional environments, and I think uh, now that we have a new law and uh, we have all of these discussions on surveillance in the world, uh, this is a good time to sit down and think, can we do something differently? And probably you'll find that the answer is yes. So um, I thought that I would also give a small um, update on the legislative status. Um, first of all, we have a new Privacy Shield agreement about data transfers to the US, maybe not so interested in for most web developers, and it's looking likely that it's not legal in either case. So uh, we'll see what the European Commission does about that. The general data protection regulation will enter into effect in two years. It's the main piece of legislation from now on uh, concerning websites. Um, there's also a law enforcement data protection directive, which will not, I think, in any way influence any web developers. Um, the e-privacy directive is up for review right now, so if you're very concerned about European legislative processes, they have a consultation about how um, the privacy and electronic communications affects uh, industry or citizens. Uh, part of that directive is the cookie legislation, which some of you may have come into contact with or been confused by. And so if you have had any particular troubles with knowing how to implement it or you haven't received any uh, notifications from your local data protection authority on how to do it in the right legal way, this is really the time to tell the European Commission about it because then that could be fixed or not, as it were. Um, the right to be forgotten is here mostly because it seems complete to add it. Uh, one of the problems that European data protection law is likely to face in the last in the upcoming years is that there's been very strong case law development at the European Court of Justice. And that means basically the legislators haven't resolved conflicts 
in the data protection regulation and the court steps in and says that according to the charter or according to the convention on human rights that all of the <coughs> European Union member states have signed, uh, we need to specify these requirements in, in a seemingly different way than the legislator had envisaged. The general data protection regulation is likely to be a victim of this uh, because it has a lot of exceptions. There's, uh, I think there's more exceptions in the general data protection regulation than there were articles in the previous directive from, from 1995, uh, so we can quickly see how the court might become a very busy entity indeed with respect to these legislations now that there's so much money at stake. Um, personally, I would have preferred if the legislator had expressed themselves more clearly on the legislation and I think the court would have done so also. Uh, but because of this circumstance, it's also difficult to say at this time what exactly the regulation will mean because the court might change or um, specify the meaning of the legislation at a later time uh, in a way which was not foreseen by anyone in the process. And I guess this is exactly what happened in the Privacy Shield and Safe Harbor discussions as well, that all the legislators said, no, this is okay, we can continue to do it this way, and then the court said, actually, you can't, and then suddenly everyone has a really big problem for at least eight or, like, up now, up almost a year. Um, if you have any questions on legislation, we will defer them until after Anders talks more about the specific advice that we've been providing to individuals and organizations about how you make a privacy-protecting website. I will leave over to you. Right, so in practice, um, two principles that you can follow is encrypt as much as you can and don't expose your visitors to third parties, that not, at least not without your consent. So things like HTTPS is uh, not just for sensitive use data or your, your admin website or whatever. It could be that the, the fact that you're visiting a certain page is in itself sensitive. Um, like for example, this is the web page of the HIV clinic at Sudden who gives it one of the biggest hospitals in, in Sweden. And they don't use encryption, which means that um, anyone between you and the website can see exactly what you're reading. And this person or entity could be your workplace, your school, maybe your flatmate, your spouse, your work, anyone in between, well, I mean the nodes between you and the server, uh, can see everything, it's all in the clear. Um, and it's not really rocket science, it's all a packet sniffer, so it's, uh, it's kind of scary. Now, had you used HTTPS, this is what the uh, attacker or listener would have seen. Everything is encrypted, except the uh, server name, which is sent as part of the TLS handshake. So, you can, someone can see that you've been to a page on certificates.se, but not which page. That's the crucial difference. This person doesn't know if you're reading about HIV or the flu or looking at opening hours or whatever. And you mean you can buy the same about Wikipedia. We do use HTTPS by default. It's, uh, you know, it's, it makes a um, big difference. The fact that surname is sent, is, is sent in the clear is a problem. But hopefully this will be fixed in the next version of TLS, maybe. There are discussions ongoing about this. It's, it's not just a matter of privacy, or put it this way, what's good for privacy is usually also good for security and vice versa. So Nicholas Weaver had a great talk uh, at Usenix in January, where he talked about uh, how to build massive event systems, how cheap it is to build such systems, how easy it is to monitor people and uh, inject traffic and how the NSA loves ad networks and things like this, you know, and PDP. And um, he concluded that unencrypted traffic is not just an information leak, it's actually an attack vector. Like, because um, it's, it's so easy to, uh, like if, if you don't know, if, if you don't use encryption, you have no idea whether you're getting what, so what did you get? This, I, I sometimes find Norwegian, and uh, like many others, they do a man in the middle attack on the on the site that he visits. Uh, they inject some JS and CSS to get their own toolbar, and uh, this is, might seem pretty harmless, but it just shows this is so trivial to do. And it couldn't just swallow in someone trying to steal credit card details or 
rewriting links or making a login form point to something else, or you know, could be some douchebag trying to inject uh, malware, or could be a state actor targeting a specific user serving modified content to that specific IP only. Another example, uh, GitHub suffered a massive, massive attack last year. What happened was that, uh, so buyers went to Google of China and like Google they had their own analytics service that lots of websites use. What happened, I think, was that one or two percent of the people visiting a site that used Baidu, visitors from outside China visiting a Baidu analytics using a site, would be served a modified JS. So the great firewall would intercept uh, and modify the JS that Baidu sent to include some code that would just constantly reload two specific pages on github.com over and over. And uh, this is pretty hard to defend against. And point being, uh, encryption, like, you don't know where your users might be or where they are, or what countries or entities traffic passes through. So for both security and privacy, you should always encrypt everything. It used to be pretty cumbersome to do this because you had to pay the SSL racket to get a certificate. But now, less than crypto, finally set the certificates free for all. And it's out of beta just last week, this week maybe. Uh, so, WordPress.com started using it for custom domains. It works brilliantly and it's free, it's automated. There's no excuse anywhere. Also, if you do use a um, certificate, you might want to consider turning on HSCS, which is strict, strand, sorry, strict transport security. Uh, it's basically just an HTTP header instructing the browser not to load any resources from your website unencrypted for a specified amount of time. If the browser begins an instruction, it will only try to use HTTP, so at best it will just refuse. So it's, very, it's great for protecting against uh, man and attacks, for example. Although we have to be careful to make it right the first. You should do some testing before you turn it on. <coughs> right. Here's another example. It's all Grenska, uh, biggest hospital in Sweden. They do use encryption, which is cool. Um, but if we scroll down, we'll see that they also have the apparently obligatory social media buttons. So this is a page about HM on Salgreska, and you scroll down, and if, if you click on the Facebook button, your browser will happily tell Facebook that you were just reading about HIV um, because of the referral header. You might not want Facebook to notice, um, it's really none of, the, none of their business. But it's not really Facebook's fault in this case, um, because usually, by default, if you visit, if you click a link or if you what uh, page loads images or whatever from somewhere, it will send the referrer header as part of the request, which is the full URL of the page that generated the, the click or the request. Um, this might have seemed like a good idea in the mid '90s when this was implemented, and the dark so when the web was the cold, dark, well, darker and colder place and more civilized. But now it's just a total privacy nightmare. But finally, you can do something about this. It doesn't involve URL redirection tools. There's something called refer policy, which lets you specify one line, a policy that will apply to all the links clicked on your page, as well as all the resources of JS, CSS, images, whatever. And there are some different uh, policies, like only send send nothing at all, or send only the base domain and the full URL, and so, or, and so on. This never, or no refers to this, the, what we prefer, of course, because you, can, you kill refers totally. And this is actually supported by all the main browsers, even Edge. Um, so with this one single line, you can make some small measurable improvement in, in privacy. Right. Um, there are lots of third-party stuff to talk about, like why you shouldn't use the vendor-provided social media buttons and things like this, you should always sell those things. 
drugs self response. Um, discuss it also nicely. Uh, but we don't have too much time, so we'll just uh, go for the main offender uh, analytics. We found that 239 out of 290 Swedish municipalities use Google Analytics, but it doesn't have to be this way. This uh, probably the nicest alternative I know of is, is PeeWeek. It's very similar to Google Analytics, but it's free and open source, and you self host it. It has very privacy settings, and, uh, and crucially, you own the data, which might also be required uh, legally in some countries. <coughs> So I will, yeah, check this out. It's super easy to install, super easy to upgrade. It's just PHP and MySQL. Good stuff. Of course, there's, there's also the alternative of not tracking at all, which is, uh, of course, sometimes for some websites it's crucial to have statistics, but maybe you shouldn't always track people just because you can, I don't know. Also, PeeWee, unlike uh, Google Analytics, can be used without cookies. Uh, you do lose some accuracy, but it's still usable. I mentioned the HSDS header before, and, but the most important thing you can think about today is content security policy. Um, There's also a header that your server sends, and the browser interprets it. And, uh, by default, if, if you set the policy at all, it will disable inline JavaScript and inline CSS. And you can uh, specify, you can, you can basically make a whitelist of approved content sources. So you can tell the browser only load JS from this domain or from the, you know, the self domain, or only load images from this and this domain, or only CSS from here or there, or a domain A, B, and C. So it's very powerful for, <coughs> for battling, uh, well, cross site scripting and code injection. And, and uh, making sure you don't accidentally leak data to third parties. So check this out. Also, I can recommend securityheaders.io is a really nice little website. You can easily check your domain and it will tell you what headers you have and tell what headers you might want to have and explain how to set them, how they work and so on. Right now we're also building a tool um, to check many of the things I've talked about. Like an online service, you just enter your URL and click a button, and it will do some magic and uh, check things like requests and cookies and services and refer things and features and tell you how and why you should do things. Um, we got some funding from the non profit Internet Foundation to do this, and it should be publicly available next month. So, to summarize, always include, don't leak stuff, kill your referrers, self-host when you can, everything can be you know. Um Embrace content security policy, it's a very powerful thing you can do. And it's supported by automated browsers. Um, and what's good for privacy is usually for security and vice versa, so even if you don't care about privacy users, you might care, you might care about security of your website. Um, so, and all these things help with that. Yeah, so um, this concludes our presentation. Um, if anything that you found here was interesting, you can always refer back to our tool, which we hope, as Anders said, to be available later. Um, don't forget to um, uh, contact your local municipalities and ask them to implement these um, good advice. At least for the public sector, I believe there should be no commercial conflicts or um, these are really sound and they're simple advice that can be implemented technically at least in a very short amount of time and at no additional expense to the organization. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed this talk. If you have any questions, you're welcome to address them uh, now or you can also talk with us at a later time during the conference. We'll be around. Thank you. It's just chocolate. I hope you enjoyed it, nevertheless. Thank you. And uh, thanks again. Questions? Yeah, um, I have a question about the, the cookie policy. Uh, 
do you know anything about uh, the situation right now in, in Germany? Do you have to implement it? As, as far as I can understand, it's, uh, it's not legally required yet uh, to, to implement um, like a tiny OK button. The cookie, the cookie policy is a problem for all of Europe because all of the member states have basically interpreted this article differently. There were about nine member states who in the month after the adoption of the directive said that actually we don't believe that this directive says what it quite clearly says. And therefore we will not enforce it. And so now that the European Commission is doing a review of the directive, I'm assuming this is going to take up a lot of their time because there's been such inconsistent enforcement. And for Germany, the only advice that I can give is go to your local data protection authority and hassle them for having specific advice. We know, for instance, that these small boxes that are recommended in some countries are hugely distracting to people who have reading difficulties or otherwise can't access um, content on a website. And so the small box clearly is not a, a preferable solution. In the UK, they had this other policy where if you visit a website, you implicitly consent to having cookies placed on your computer, but this is a very strained interpretation of the law, because if you implicitly consent to cookies by visiting a website, what else can you implicitly consent to by, by surfing the web? I mean, it becomes, from a contract law perspective, that type of interpretation is uh, legally problematic, um, you would say. Um, and part of the blame, I think, goes also to the European Commission for not engaging positively and constructively with standardization processes. So at the World Wide Web Consortium for a long time, they were discussing this do not track policy that some of you may have heard of. Um, but because there was such a large dominance of um, American industry actors and very little representation of, of uh, European kind of oversight or data protection authorities or telecoms authorities that are also somewhere um, in some places responsible for this law, um, the do not track procedure couldn't, didn't have the opportunity to lead to good standardization for the European law, which of course creates a major hassle for everyone making websites. But, but it's, um, um, if you're uncertain about this or you find that your data protection authority won't help you, then please do take the time to go to the European Commission uh, uh, Your Voice in Europe website and ensure that you communicate as much on, the, on these parts of the e-privacy directive to the European Commission. The consultation is very, like, it's very nicely made out. There's a question 33 at the very end where you can write whatever you want. So if you don't want to look through the entire consultation and figure out specifically which question you answer, you should answer, just go to question 33 and put in whatever you want there. And then it's the Commission's problem to interpret that. You're also allowed to answer in German. The Commission is obliged to receive in all of the member state languages. Uh, so it's also a tip for your friends, maybe. A different question? Yes. Or two different, you were first. Okay. Okay, I'll ask. Uh, I had a question about the content security policy because I, uh, first time I, I, you know, get in trouble with it. Uh, so, you do, uh, like, you can list the, the, the URLs of the, uh, of the external scripts or something, mm -hmm. or because, uh, let's say, you have a, a website that really, you know, that, that is not that really needs uh, the resources hosted on CDN. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you can just list that CDN. So you can specify, yeah. uh, this is just to prevent the uh, you know, uh, uh, injection of scripts. Um, yeah, cross site script injection and yes. Yeah. Can you tell us more about the, the privacy shield? The what? Privacy, privacy shield. shield. Privacy shield. Like. There, I mean, there isn't much to say about the privacy shield. It's, the European Commission negotiated a new decision for data transfer adequacy with the, um, with the Americans. Um, and then there were some industry players and big law firms that said, oh, this new decision looks very great. And then the Article 29 group said, well, it's an improvement, but it's not so much of an improvement, actually. Um, and so now the question is whether the, the European Commission doesn't have to listen to the Article 29 group. So even if the data protection authorities of Europe have said that we believe you negotiated a, a bad text, which is essentially what they're saying, that the, the text isn't good enough, they're saying. 
Um, but the European Commission can go ahead and approve the decision anyway, and then it will be up to some um, industrious citizen, maybe Max Schrems from Austria, to take the decision to the European Court of Justice again, and then the European Court of Justice could either have to say that the data protection authorities were right or the European Commission was right. So we're now in a continued state of legal uncertainty. Um, and this is also because the court also created a problem for the Commission. Right? The Commission had already known for 10 years that the safe harbor agreements weren't um, up to standards with European data protection law. But in 2004, when they found this out, they didn't do anything. In 2008, when they found, it out, found this out, they didn't do anything. When the European Parliament said in 2012, listen, you gotta do something about this, the European Commission said that no, the safe harbor agreement isn't illegal, it's just unsafe, so we will keep it in place. Uh, and then when the European Court of Justice finally says that all of these suspicions that have been around for a decade, that this, that this decision isn't valid or true, everyone acts as if it's a big surprise. Um, and now the European Commission, by its own political, I don't want to say incompetence, uh, but you'll have to infer from that, um, ensure that there is continued legal uncertainty, which is a problem for, for everyone. And I think it's a problem also on both sides of the Atlantic, right? It's a, essentially, it's turned down into an international negotiation, so it boils down to who has the best negotiators, who has the most loyal negotiators. And the member states aren't helping the Commission either, to be fair. It's fairly common in the European Union that the member states that have insight into negotiations will go around the back of the Commission and, and tell, you know, a third negotiating party that if you, you know, we're going to do this, so if you do this for me, I will give you more information on how to sidetrack the Commission in its negotiation efforts. Uh, and this type of uh, political, top level political non acceptance of the European Court of Justice supremacy over what data protection in Europe is, um, is likely to cause problems for, for a good long, long while. Right? Um, and I think the European Court of Justice is also interesting because they're acting as if they are a Supreme Court, which I think the member states hadn't envisaged when they signed the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So it's. Uh, does that. Uh, it's sufficient. No, no, no. Um, I, I would, I would like to know your personal perspective on, um, well, the fact that that we see huge corporations uh, collecting huge data from uh, consumers by giving them basically free gadgets, uh, free platforms, free shit, whatever. And um, your personal perspective. Is any sort of legislation or law enforcement and law enforcement basically because any legislation is useless without law enforcement? Is any legislation ever going to keep up with the um, speed of innovation in that technical sector of collecting data? Well, I mean, what I hope that we have illustrated here today is that legislation can also be a tool for innovation. Right? So we've identified all of these. Uh, a uh, number of technical measures that have been uh, developed over time in order to make better privacy protection. We used to not have easy access to TLS, now we have easy access to TLS. We used to not have a way to deal with referrers, now we have a way to deal with referrers. Data protection can and should, in its own right, be a means of innovation. Um, but of course, if, uh, as long as it's cheaper and simpler not to protect data, and as long as it's easier and, and simpler to um, exploit the relative technical inability of the user to guard against privacy invasions, then that is probably what's going to happen. So a very important part of the new European data protection framework are exactly these, these sanctions, right? That they, they raised the sanctions by quite a bit, so now companies that do not innovate in line with data protection run, run the risk of it costing them a lot of money. Uh, but then again, that relies in itself on data protection enforcement, which we can go back on the cookie legislation for that, actually, the data protection authorities in the EU are often underfunded, they don't have technical competence, um, far too many organizations deal with data for them to be able to keep up and administer good guidelines. In Belgium, what happened in the Facebook case that was recently tried on Facebook's use of, of cookies to monitor non-members of Facebook in order to enhance their security, they said, um, Facebook was technically complying with uh, the recommendations set forth by the Data Protection Authority. But the court decided that Facebook wasn't in compliance with the Belgian law because Facebook cannot claim to have had consent from people who aren't members of Facebook to be tracked. 
And so, in this case, Facebook was following the advice of the Data Protection Authority, and they still were uh, convicted in the court for, for doing something wrong. And that means the Data Protection Authority provided bad and legally unsound advice, which is a big problem for a company if there's a lot of money at stake for that company. You have to be able to rely on that. Um, so one of my expectations for the future is also that we're going to see a lot more demands on data protection authorities being adequately funded. Uh, maybe similar to how telecommunications authorities are. I forget what the German one is called, but, but the, they're the people that do specialized competition rules for telecommunications markets. Um, and they are quite well funded. They often have a large staff and, and lots of legal experts and technical experts to be able to provide good advice to industry actors, and that's going to be necessary enough for data protection as well. I can just add this, <coughs> but I mentioned there's a great new website called report-uri.io where you can analyze your content security policy. And also they have a nice tool with which, we, with which you can build these policies. So, extremely useful website. Report-uri.io. <coughs> hmm. So, if that exhausts all of the questions, I guess that we will wrap up. Yep. Thank you all for your kind attention and your interesting questions.